Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and today we are looking at creating guilds and organisations within your setting. Now, guilds offer us a remarkable opportunity to create flavour for our campaign, but they can serve so much more and bring so much more life to your game if we just know how to use them properly. So in today's video, we're going to look at the purpose of them. We're going to look at the structure of them. We're going to look at them as a relationship guide. We're going to look at how to join a guild, the costs and requirements that go into that. What are the perks of having a guild or joining a guild in your game? And of course, then how to create the guilds in terms of an enemy or a rival guild to give them that sense of life and history. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's kick off. What's the purpose of the guild? Now, the purpose of the guild within your world is not just limited to what does it do in your campaign setting. If you have a guild specifically for necromancers, for example, well, that's it. that's its purpose, is it's a guild for necromancers. But what's its purpose within your narrative, within your story? Does it help to motivate the characters? So, in other words, it's a guild that they can go to for advice and for help. Uh, they can use it as a resource that will motivate them to continue on their adventures. Does it perhaps harass the players? Is its function to act as an opposition to the players? So it's an assassin's guild that's hunting down the players. Is it something that's there simply to embellish? So it's not a guild that the players will necessarily interact with. It might be the homemakers guild of cooks and scullery maids and it's really just there to act as an embellishment on your your plot on your setting and on your story. The players will appreciate the attention to detail, but aside from that, the guild is not going to really do very much for the players themselves. If we decide that it's a motivational guild, its purpose is to help the PCs as they journey through your world, then we need to lay out a few ground rules. We also need to do that if they're there to harass the PCs because, well, they're going to want to investigate that guild possibly and you need to have all of that information at your fingertips. So armed with the decision that the guild's purpose is X, you can now move forward. And if it's just there for embellishment, you can continue with this video as well, but it's really just icing on the cake at this point in time. If it's there just to have a little bit of life in your campaign, you don't have to go into too much detail. But we are looking at motivating or harassing the PCs, this particular guild that we're looking at. So the next thing to then try and unpack is the structure. Now, again, the structure, how do we do that? Where do we come up with these wonderful names for all the different ranks, the different tiers, the uh, acolyte, the grunt, the sergeant, the lieutenant, the captain, the leaders, the sub-leaders, the assistant clerks, the assistant to the assistant clerks, the assistant to the assistant assistant clerks. All those kind of roles need to be identified because ultimately players are going to encounter members from the different strata in the guild as they engage with the guild more and more and more. Now, of course, one can return to your history books and look at military organizations or religious organizations of the past, and there are many of them. I actually recall, I think it was in 2nd edition Dungeons & Dragons, the, or 3rd edition Dungeons & Dragons, the DM Guide. No, I think it was 2nd. Anyway, you can correct me later. I think it was in the 2nd edition Dungeon Master's Guide where they actually had a page that listed... In Western Catholicism, these were the different ranks within the Roman Catholic Church. In Eastern Orthodox, these are the ranks within that church. This is what they called a king, a queen, a leader in Russia during the Tsarist period. This is what they called them in the Aztec Kingdom. So in other words, they gave you lists of names and then you could almost choose them. I like to come up with my own names, though, for my guilds and structures and organizations. It makes them personal, but it also allows me to reinforce their purpose and possibly the theme or the master plot of the game. So if the structure is there to help the players, but it's perhaps a slightly sinister one where there's an air of darkness to it, I might start to choose names for those different ranks that convey that. 
um, superior seer or something that's got a lot of S's in it to make that sinister feel come across. I might choose names like Lord Dark Archon or uh, Venerated Shadow. However you want to name it, it's up to you. But the idea is that you can continue to push the purpose of that space even more. If it's there to harass the players, you can have fun. If it's there to just create flavor, you might want to do something along the lines where you almost embody the essence of the class that the guild represents. I've got a druid group, a druid organization within my one world, and I simply went, well, I could call them Keeper or Warden protector of the grove those are the usual kind of things but they feel very impersonal to me and they also feel a little bit like their modern day naming conventions rather than um, things that druids would go with so instead i thought well they are all about trees and things so let me call them the uh, oak kin is the leader of the druids and then the birch kin and the Ashkin and the Willowkin are different ranks within it. Of course, only much later did I realize that one of the titles will, of course, be the Pumpkin, which, um, yes, I suppose I will actually work into a festival within my guild so that when the players make that joke, I can go, yes, if you want to be the Grand High Pumpkin, you have to attend the festival. Anyway, the idea was that I wanted to create a sense of the druids and that they were kin to the forests and these were the different types of trees within the forest. That, that's, that's the idea. So, again, within the structure of the organization, you can then come up with flavors that are going to really reinforce your theme, your idea. Now, Relationship Tracker has popped up in multiple systems. There are lots of different role-playing systems that have uh, Loyalty Tracker, Honor Tracker, Familiarity, Reputation, whatever you want to call it. It's basically what is the fundamental relationship between the PC and this group. And effectively, they boil down to things like if the group openly promotes the guild, the guild feels more kindly towards them, and you adjust them in the positive way of the uh, guild's favor. If they do something that's completely adverse to the guild or outright attacks the guild, it puts them in a negative of the guild, and slowly they work their way up the scale, becoming more and more and more familiar, more and more well-known with the guild, or more and more and more hated with the guild. Now, that should translate into something. Perhaps when they arrive in the guild, if their reputation is very high with the guild, the guild members treat them with more respect and more dignity. If they're, of course, hated by the guild, whenever guild members see them, they might attack them on sight or try and cause trouble with them. And, of course, players can try and balance that relationship. I literally create a relationship tracker with the guilds that the players interact with on a regular basis or semi-regular basis, and then I just keep track as the players go about doing their character business with that particular guild. It creates quite a nice sense of continuity as well as the fact that the guild is actually responding to what the players are doing or what their characters are doing anyway in the world. Now, of course, when the characters get to a point where they realize the guild could be useful, especially if you decided that the guild is going to motivate the characters or the players, you can then work out how they should join that guild. Now, there's really two ways of doing this. Either it's some kind of monetary payment or it's a 24-hour vigil of a ceremony of purification, or it's a quest. We need you to go and find this or that. Or it could be within the guild house itself. If it's the Guild of Adventurers, maybe they've set up a dungeon that's filled with NPCs that are played by other guild members who have a magical spell on them that allow them to take damage and look as if they die, but not actually die. However you want to play it out, joining the guild should be something that's a little bit more than just signing your name on the dotted line and moving forward. Unless that's your shtick, in which case they sign on the dotted line and then weeks later they get tested by the guild to see if they're actually worthy of the guild status. Again, though, it's just really an expression of one of the two ways of joining the guild. I would recommend that if you let players join guilds, you need to give those guilds something that can help the players, but not enable the players too much. So in other words, if it's a guild of librarians or knowledge seekers, the players shouldn't just frequently return to the guild and say, well, I use my guild membership. I need to know about the ways of killing an undead lich who has been around for a thousand years and has done this and that and the next thing. That's an abuse of the guild, and you don't want that to happen. It really, really is, is it's going to destabilize the game. 
On the other hand, you also don't want the guild to feel as if it's a complete waste of time. It needs to provide support for the characters. Good discount on equipment and items, perhaps. A friendly bed to sleep in when they arrive in certain towns that have got guild houses. All those kind of things can really just make it feel as if the characters are part of a guild. Of course, the characters should, from time to time, get requests from guild members and guild leaders to participate or help them on certain adventures and quests, and that will just really entrench the guild as being this active and alive organisation within your world. And it's something that's important. If you've put it there, you might as well use it. It becomes a great adventure hooker as well, in terms of pulling the player's characters into certain adventures and things that are a result of the guild either hunting the characters or supporting the characters. Costs and requirements in terms of belonging to the guild is important to bear in mind as well. Is the cost a monthly or yearly fee? Monthly gets a little bit taxing in terms of trying to keep track of everything. If it's a yearly fee, how much is it? Is it an exclusive guild? Is it really worth it? And how do you decide that? How do you decide if it's worth it or not? Well, quite frankly, you've just got to sit back and say, would you be willing to pay it if you were a player? 100 gold a year, that's a bit pricey if you're only getting a free bed every now and again. That's a lot of free beds you'd need to sleep in in order to make up the ability or the... Uh, well, give motivation as to why they should join the guild in the first place. So you need to off offset the costs with the rewards, but there should be a cost. There should be intrinsically something that requires the players to engage with the guild on a semi-regular basis. Again, we're just trying to entrench the guild within the player's psyche as being this place that they can go to or that they should be avoiding. Either way, later on we can use it in our adventure paths as we can destroy it, we can give it more power, we can give it royal legitimacy, we can have it taken over by an organisation that the players now have to go and thwart. So in other words, it is an investment that we are making in terms of giving us an absolute, absolute treasure trove of adventures that we can just give the players as we need them. So if you have an ad hoc session or a session that doesn't seem to be going anywhere, then you can have something happen to the guild. Especially if the players are invested in it, they will then want to participate. And that's absolutely, absolutely fine and fantastic for us because it means that, well, our job has just made that much easier. So we then have to look at the perks of the guild. I have touched on this briefly in terms of not overpowering the perks and not underpowering them either. Things like fact-finding, um, base of operations, you've got some rooms in the guild hall where you can return to from time to time. That would be something that's very, very useful for players, especially since players generally live out of inns and taverns and carry everything on their backs. If you don't want to give them their own estate to begin with, give them a guild space to stay in. And of course, later on, you can burn it down, blow it up, all those wonderful things. So you've got to give them some kind of perk for belonging to the guild. And you've got to look at how do they go up in rank within the guild. Be careful to pace yourself. You don't want your players suddenly, after reaching level 5 in the system, the role-playing system, suddenly head of a guild. That changes the role-playing space quite dramatically. Also, being head of a guild means that they really shouldn't go adventuring. They should stay and run the guild. That's what heads of guilds do. So be careful with that. You want to make sure that the players rise in rank a little bit. Get them to a rank that's kind of cool, like a captain rank or a lieutenant rank or lieutenant rank, however you want to pronounce it. Yet let them get to that space, but then, well, don't let them get too much further than that unless you've got a very good plan as to how or why they would be leaving the guild on a regular basis to go adventuring. That is something to bear in mind. And then finally, you've got to look at the enemies of the guild. Who are those organizations or individuals who are in opposition to the guild? If the guild's purpose within your general story is to motivate the players, in other words, it's a base of operations, it's there to support them, the enemies of the guild would obviously be enemies of the player characters as well. Stands to reason. So the idea there is, of course, that you're creating animosity, you're creating a living world that feels as if there's these different organizations that are fighting. If, of course, the guild is the enemy guild, they're there to harass the players, then of course the enemy of that enemy becomes the ally of the players and again it just opens up plot options for you. So by adding a guild or six or twenty into your world, you suddenly start to create massive possibilities for your players and for their characters to interact a bit more with your world to get a sense that it's a much richer space than it first met the eye 
And of course, it then gives you as the GM plenty of opportunities to bring in adventures, throw things around, build in player loyalty into your world because now they've got rooms in the in the guild hall. They've now got friends in the guild hall. They're becoming they're having a reputation within the guild. All of those wonderful things you can then use and manipulate and twist and turn to create adventures that your players are definitely one are going to go on to protect their reputation or to protect the guild they have become part of. So guilds can be really, really, really cool, and you can go mad with the naming conventions, the ranking systems, all of those kind of things, and really express your creativity. And look at different types of guilds as well. One doesn't just one doesn't just need to have the carpenters guild or the wizards guild, all of those kind of things. You don't just have to have those. You can push them further. You could have the guild of adventurers. Well, that's a little bit over the yeah. Okay, all right boring bad example you could have something like the guild of acquired tastes or the guild of gentlemen the guild of ladies the guild of night riders however whatever you want to come up with you can create your own that have these really cool and mysterious names and things uh, that the players can explore and of course become part of I hope this has been helpful in terms of inspiring you perhaps to add a guild or two to your role-playing world. And if you have guilds already, maybe this has inspired you to embellish them or expand them a little bit. And of course, if you just nodded throughout the whole video, well, then you're slap bang on course in terms of making a guild within your world as far as I'm concerned. I hope, I hope that, um, well, I've already said that, haven't I? What I was going to say is, I hope that you find these videos um, useful. And of course, let me know. Send me topics to talk about. I've almost run out of the list that has been building over time. Let me know what you want more of or less of. That's always useful in the comments below. I do read all of them, even if I don't respond. Until next time, if you want to find a group, head on over to www.rpgtablefinder.com where you can set up your own table and uh, not play on the system, but you can get people together on the system, socialize with them. There's dice rollers, there's chat channels there. And of course, you can then set up an online game or a real tabletop game within your own community at home. It's a very, very good resource for aggregating that. Another great resource is www.worldanvil.com who are now a partner with the channel and support rpgtablefinder.com. So they all link together to help you create a wonderful campaign and then to share it and find players to come and play in your campaign world. So check both of those out. And of course, you can always head over to www.greatgamemaster.com where you can find all of the videos that are on this channel categorized into different or different sort of styles and organizations and levels of GM and all those kind of wonderful things. Until next time then, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming.